And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel Record of Luke. The Gospel Record of Luke and chapter number 22. The Gospel Record of Luke in chapter number 22. The Lord Jesus Christ has finished up his earthly ministry and now he is hours away from going to the cross. Several days earlier he made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem and while he was at Jerusalem he had preached at the temple every day and the people came to hear him willingly. The Pharisees have crossed a line and instead of trying to just make Jesus look bad or to chase away his followers, they've crossed the line and they are actively finding a way to try to kill and murder Jesus. Their problem is that the crowds were always around Jesus and if they tried to arrest Jesus in the middle of a crowd, that the crowds would rebel and try to protect Jesus. But their hopes were answered when Judas Iscariot decided he was going to betray Jesus and they are working out on a deal where they can arrest Jesus without the crowds around. And Jesus observed the Last Supper. It was during that time that Judas Iscariot had went and he is currently present tense going to gather up the army, gather up the Roman soldiers, to gather up the leaders for the Pharisees, and they are preparing for the false trial and preparing to arrest Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, the rest of the 11 disciples have traveled with Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ has already uh, been walking with them and trying to teach them. He's taught them about being a servant, that the... um, Disciples right after the Last Supper begin to fight and have strife among themselves and just a fit full of pride trying to figure out who was going to be the best. Then Jesus turned to Peter and explained to him that when thou art strengthened, um, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Jesus Christ then continues on to teach the disciples, trying to prepare them for the new adventure they're going to have of going on without Jesus Christ physically with them to have the disciples go on. Of course, this is further explained in the gospel record of John chapter 13 through 17, but we see the snippet, the uh, an important idea in the gospel record of chapter 22. The gospel record of Luke chapter 22 And notice with me, if you don't mind, starting at verse 35. The gospel record of Luke chapter 22 and verse number 35, the Bible says this. And he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, nothing. Then said he unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his script, that he hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that was written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that is found in the Gospel record of Luke in chapter 22? The Gospel record of Luke chapter 22, and notice with me in verse number 38, the expression of the disciples as they think they're responding properly to Jesus and are not, where they said, two swords, two swords. And with the Lord's help, we want to preach this idea of these two swords in the context of what Jesus Christ was trying to teach his disciples. And we love you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come up to you, Lord, I recognize my own condition right now with medication, lack of sleep. My mind is not where it ought to be. Lord, I can't trust my mind, I can't trust my tongue, I can't trust my thoughts, but I can trust you. So the best I know how, I surrender those things to you. My time, this message, my ambitions, my goals, my speech, my tongue, my thoughts, I give them to you and ask that you take them and that you would use them for your glory and your honor. I would never want to waste these good folks' time. And I know that I have nothing to give to them. But your word is so rich and full and your spirit is so capable. 
that we can trust you and your word to get accomplished what you want to get accomplished, even beyond my own infirmities and my own stumbling blocks, my own being in the way. Clarify my mind now, especially with a subject such as this that has so much confusion. Lord, don't let me add to the confusion, but rather let's clarify things. Thank you, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was just mentioning, even within this prayer, this is a commonly misused, abused passage. This passage has been taken out of context throughout the centuries. This passage has produced lots of fighting and confusion. To make matters worse, Jesus' own disciples were confused and gave the wrong answer. What was it that Jesus was trying to get across when he was talking about that they were supposed to buy a sword and that their response of two swords? Now, some of the confusion that's come about is some people have taken this out of context and tried to read into this context and had the idea that we have two swords. This is the wrong teaching, but this is what some people have said, is that we have the sword of the spirit, the word of God, and we have a physical sword. And we're either going to convert you this way, or we're going to convert you this way. And so because of this throughout the centuries, because people misuse this passage, people came to the place where they said that if you won't obey the Bible, we're going to force you to. And so thus you've had things in history, such as the Crusades, such as the Inquisitions. You've had so many things where people were determined that they had to force people to believe what they should believe. And this is a common idea that people say, listen, I'm so passionate. I believe that I'm right. And I feel like I got to do whatever it takes to make them. That's our first mistake. It is not your job to make anyone believe the truth. It is not your responsibility to twist someone's arm and force someone to believe as we are. But people use this passage all the time to justify all the awful things that have been done in the name of Jesus Christ. You had someone like John Calvin who had a man come up that did not believe like John Calvin. And so as history tells us, John Calvin put that man's face in a well and drowned that guy because he would not believe like he did. All throughout history, we've had church governments, meaning that actual national governments that were run by the church that thought it was their responsibility to make people believe. In fact, even in our own country, when our country was founded and the constitution was passed, nine out of the 13 colonies had a state church. And they said that if you don't believe like we do, we will put you in jail. And so even in America, blood was shed for the purpose of religious liberty because people thought it was their responsibility to make people believe. The very first person to have his blood shed in America was Obadiah Holmes. Just because he did not believe just like the colony government that he was in, he was Baptist, they were not. They said, you stop being a Baptist and believe like we do. And he says, I cannot. They put him in jail and then they whipped him. He was the first one to have blood shed. Unfortunately, he was not the only one. We understand that people have used this as a justification for almost 2,000 years where they've mistaught this passage and justified the idea of persecuting, the idea of forcing someone. Even if you look at Catholic history, we know that there are many crusades and not all of them were to go free the Holy Land. They had one crusade that went deeper into Europe to kill all the Huguenots and all the Bible believers. We know that people have used this to justify all kinds of awful acts. So when we say that this is a misused passage, we're not uh, putting an overemphasis. We're putting an underemphasis. This has been a passage people have used to justify I have the responsibility to force people to believe like I do. Well, if this is not what is being said, 
What is Jesus teaching? We need to have a good understanding of this passage so we are not confused. What is Jesus teaching? Well, if you don't mind, the first thing I would like to bring to you is the former dispensation. The former dispensation. Now I just used a big word. What is a dispensation? A dispensation is an error of time where things work differently than other errors. Eras. E-R-A. Eras. And so Jesus Christ starts by saying how things worked before. When he's talking to his disciples, he's going to bring up where he sends them out to go witnessing. Remember, there was a time that he sent his disciples out to the countryside and they were out for about eight months to a year. You guys remember when we had spoke on that? Well, this is what he brings up in verse 35. And he, Jesus, said to them, the disciples, when I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything. Now remember, Jesus Christ sent them out to the countryside. Remember, he told them that you don't need to bring any uh, a sack for money. You don't need a point curse. You don't need to bring extra shoes. You don't need to bring extra coat. You just go and preach and let me take care of you while you go out there. God will supply. That is, you go out, they'll have people that will house you, people that will take care of you. If not, you shake your feet and go to the next one, and you go ahead and spread the word, prepare for my coming, go. And when they came back, they were rejoicing and explaining all the miracles. Listen, we were taken care of, and we were out of money here, and God took care of us here, and we were just obeying God, and it was wonderful. And they came back and they rejoiced. There was that whole period of time where that worked. Remember, Jesus said that they would be sent out with no protection. In fact, let me see if I can find that passage, if you don't mind. That was earlier in the Gospel record of Luke. Forgive me for not having that passage marked beforehand. Um, the Gospel record of Luke chapter 10. The Gospel record of Luke chapter 10. The Gospel record of Luke chapter 10. This is Jesus' earlier instructions to the 70. Gospel record of Luke chapter 10 verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whether he himself would go. So the 70 were sent out. They were supposed to go to every town, every village to help prepare for Jesus physically to come to that city so people would be ready for him. Verse 2, therefore, so because he was sending them out, he said to them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth the laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Now he said, I'm sending you defenseless. I'm sending you with no protection. I will protect you. You're going out like little lambs. You're going to feel, um, you're going to feel naked. You're going to feel defenseless, but I'm going to take care of you. Verse number four, carry neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way. And we took time to explain that, that don't bring script. Don't pair an extra pair of shoes. Uh, don't spend time to give long greetings because you have a purpose to get things accomplished. And to whatsoever house you enter first, say peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon them. If not, turn you again, again. And it goes on and it says that God is going to take care of them. Verse 8, and to whatsoever city you enter, they receive you, eat such things as set before you, and heal the sick that are in. And they that say to you, the kingdom of God has come nigh to you. And then verse number 17, and the 70 returned again with joy eight months later, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject through thy name. So when he sent them out, he sent them as sheep, um, lambs among the slaughter. He's sending them out to, uh, to go out and trust God. They were working with Hebrew people. They were Hebrew people working with Hebrew people, preparing for Jesus who was following behind them to eventually come into that village. That's how it worked before. They weren't to share uh, social pleasantries. They were, had the king's business to go to. They were instructions for that particular people, for that particular place, at that particular period, for that particular purpose. 
once the nation of Israel became openly hostile towards its rejection of Christ, and the church replaces Israel in reaching the world. Remember, at this time, it is still Israel's job to reach the world. But now, in Luke 22, as we turn back there, things are changing. There was a previous dispensation, but now as Jesus goes to the cross, as he is going to be buried on a borrowed tomb, rise again the third day, he is going to send up to heaven after that, things will work differently. Which now brings us to the second thing, the next dispensation. So things worked one way before, but now things will work differently. There's a next dispensation. Notice with me in Luke 22 and verse 36. Luke 22 and verse 36. Then said he, Jesus, unto them, the disciples, but now. He's saying things now change. Things are different. But now things have changed. Now he that hath a purse let him take it. Now, before he said, don't take money with you. You're not going to need it. I'm going to take care of you supernaturally. I'm going to make sure people take care of you. I'm going to have things set up. But now, now you take a purse, carrying the idea that you are going to be responsible for money. You are going to have to make sure that things are financed. You are going to have to make sure that you do your part. Take a purse. Uh, him that hath a purse, let him take it. Likewise, his script he says, now you're supposed to take a script. Then he said, he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Now, is this going to be for the purpose that now I got a sword, I'm going to force people? No. We understand that before Jesus sent them specifically, he said, I'm sending you out to lambs in the midst of wolves. I'm sending you out defenseless. Now, things are different. The world is going to be different. You're not... Um, Jewish people working with other Hebrew people, you are now the church going to go work out into a lost and dying world. And the lost and dying world is not going to be a friendly place. There are going to be opposition. There are going to be bandits. There are going to be people who are against you. And there are going to be circumstances where you need to defend yourself. There are a right time to stand up and defend yourself. There are going to be times that you need to die as a martyr, but you know what? If somebody is coming to, to harm you and your family while you're doing the work of God, maybe you should think about protecting them and watching over them. Having this idea of self-defense. Christians have a right for self-defense in appropriate situation. The servants of Christ will be prepared for a different kind of war in a different world. It is not it is to allow the gospel to go out, but not to force the gospel upon people. That's not what it's saying. But it's saying you're in a world that's going to be hostile to you, that you're going to have to make sure that there's going to be finances. Pray for the finances. You're responsible for making sure that the finances are there to fund the building to take. You're responsible for making sure the things are are financed properly, organized properly. You're responsible of making sure that there's correct decisions for the protection of you and your family in reasonable circumstances. For example, some pastor may say, listen here, we need to live by faith, and so we're not going to put locks on our door. In Seymour, it may not matter as much, but you know, in downtown Chicago, is locks on the door reasonable? Are bars on the door reasonable? Absolutely. Is an alarm system reasonable? Is camera systems reasonable in places? Absolutely. So there's an idea of living by faith, but you understand we're in a hostile world that's against Christian, against God, and that is just nasty to start with. People are nasty to each other, much less the church. And there are some things that had wisdom. I've had pastors say, listen, I'm going to live by faith, and so I'm not going to have insurance. That was a different time, different place. There should be a reasonable thing where you prepare wisely for your own health. There are times that it's necessary to have life insurance for the care of my loved ones if something happened to me. There is an idea of reasonable preparedness in a world that's falling apart. 
Listen, I got to live by faith. I don't need to have auto insurance. I, I just get by. Okay, cool. Just wait for that accident to happen and go see how well you start going to a GoFundMe page. There's an idea of reasonable preparedness in the world we live in. We understand faith does factor in, but my faith is not an insurance, but it is a reasonable thing that I've done everything I can with wisdom in the world that I live in. Does that make sense? This is what it's speaking about. We're in a different time, different dispensation, different things, how it works. God has every expectation for us to do everything reasonable for our protection and for going on. We're in a church. We don't need insurance for a church building. Oh, yes, we do. You never know what will happen. There are reasonable things, whether it's insurance or protection, safety things. For example, we live in a world today where people do come into a church and shoot people up. There should be reasonable protections for plans. We were in a church where we had enough medical people that we actually had a medical organization. If somebody had a heart attack in the middle of a service, what do we do? Those are reasonable plans. Well, we're just going to respond by faith. Hey, when an emergency happens, do people respond by faith? They respond by panic. There needs to be reasonable preparedness for the world we live in. Does that make sense? This is what this passage is speaking about. A reasonable preparedness for the world we live in and the culture we live in. I have all the time where police officers and preachers tell me I need to go get my concealed carry. I very much considered it, except that I can't afford my gun. No, I mean, but you don't understand, I don't think that's unreasonable. There are reasonable things that we should do. You say, well, I'm against guns. Well, praise the Lord. That is your decision. That's up to you. We can't force that upon each other. But as the pastor of the church, there are things that we should reasonably do to protection in the world that we live in. Does it make sense? Trying to make sure that the light bulbs are on and at least hear rocks moving in people's heads. To make sure the gospel makes it around the world, reasonable preparedness needs to be made to secure income, to secure protection, to secure reasonable expectations, and to ensure a measure of protection and a peace of mind. We're thankful for that. And those are things that we can do because we do live in a different world. Which now brings us to something else. The current event. The current event. For I say unto you that this that this that is written must ye be accomplished in me. So Jesus is fixing to quote scripture. He's actually going to quote Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 12. Notice what he says. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. Jesus was about to be taken and numbered among the transgressors. Isaiah 53, of course, is the wonderful passage in Isaiah that speaks about that he was bruised for our iniquities. <clears throat> he was, uh, he paid the price on the cross to give us freedom. He paid that. At the end of Isaiah 53, it says that he was numbered around the transgressors. These are going to happen. These are things that are going on. At the current time, as Jesus is telling this to the disciples, as he says, these must happen, I'm going to be reckoned among them. At the current time, down the hill, they're in the Mount of Olives now, they've now traveled. Down the hill in Jerusalem, Judas is gathering up the Roman soldiers. At the time that he is speaking, he has now talked to the, the Pharisees who are giving the authority and giving the instructions to the Roman soldiers about arresting Jesus without a crowd. Right now, Jesus knows everything. This is what's happening. And he's telling his disciples that, listen, right now's the time. Right now, it's going to happen. They are coming now. He's trying to say the world's changed at this current time. It is coming up. <laughs> Things were now at an end, but for Jesus, he was sending the church and its mission to continue on. He says, boys, they're taking me now. 
In a matter of hours, you won't have me anymore. But I have the expectation you will continue. And he goes on and explains in John chapter 13 through 16 the expectations of how they can move on without him. But he's saying right now they are arranging. Right now's the end. Right now you have to make preparations to go on without me. At this current time, they are coming for us. Which brings us to the one last thing, the tragic misunderstanding. The tragic misunderstanding. Jesus did a lot of teaching in John 13 through 16 of things they didn't understand until later. He tried to teach them, but they weren't coming on. The light bulb wasn't on. They were just looking at him kind of at a calf at a new gate. Like, what is this? What are you talking about? It doesn't make sense. It will make sense later, but at this current time, they don't understand. How do we know they don't understand? Verse 40, uh, 38. Verse 38. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. So what happened is that they stopped listening to him. Jesus said, listen, if whoever has, doesn't have a garment or has a garment, sell it, get a sword. Speaking about that, you need to have a reasonable expectation. All they heard was, hey, you need to get a sword. So they do a check. There's 11 of them there. Hey, does anybody got a sword? Hey, don't you, hey, we got two swords. We're ready to go. All right, that's enough. You can almost see Jesus kind of sigh. He knew they didn't get it. Knew they weren't listening. Knew that they had checked out. Nothing like a teacher looking at his students and they know they didn't hear a single thing. We got two swords, Jesus. Now, at the current time, they got a legion of soldiers coming. What good is two swords going to do against this legion of soldiers? They're not going to do much, especially against professional soldiers. Praise the Lord that two of them had swords traveling on. That kind of changes the uh, image of the 12 disciples. They were carrying armed. There was two of them packing heat, ready to go. One of them was Peter, by the way. We'll see that a little bit later. They were packing, but they do an inventory. So Jesus is talking. They're going, hey, you got a sword? Hey, you got a sword? You got a sword? Peter's like, why aren't you guys carrying swords? I kept telling you, you need a pack. Told you you need to have be armed at all times. No one's listening to Jesus. They go, oh, Jesus, we need inventory. We're ready. We got two swords. That's enough. Why even teach anymore when they're not listening? New subject. We'll go on. It's enough. You know, Jesus had no intention of having an armed conflict. Not here, not now. If he really wanted an armed conflict, he had 12 legions of angels waiting to be summoned. By the way, how much can two legions of angels do? Well, remember, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians just in one night. What would happen if you had 12 legions, 12 divisions of angels ready to go? They could wipe out the entire population of the world. Jesus was not worried about who would win an armed conflict. He would win. But he's not looking for an armed conflict. His two little piddly disciples with swords were not going to carry enough. In fact, you're going to see later on, they're all going to run like little girls. <laughs> running, screaming, running for their lives. It's going to be gone. It's not the idea that he's expecting these 11 to stand and defend Jesus Christ. They misunderstood what he taught. And, and they think that when Jesus said it's enough, that they did good. Oh, look, we did good. He said, yeah, good job. Yeah, good job. Next subject. They missed everything. Peter still didn't get it. Satan was after him. Remember, Jesus said, uh, Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath the desire to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. We're going to see that pride and Satan is working in Peter. He's going to take his sword. He's going to try to defend Jesus. And Jesus didn't need to be defended. How do you know Jesus didn't need to be defended? He kept telling them, they're going to arrest me. They're coming now. I'm going to be arrested. It's going to happen. Let it happen. This is what needs to happen. That's kind of what the warning that he's saying here. It must yet be accomplished. Boys, they're coming now. This must happen. Peter says, I'm not going to let anything happen to you. I made you a promise. I'm ready to go. Good job, Peter. Good job. 
They didn't get it at all. And again, we understand that so many people don't get this passage. Jesus is trying to give them preparedness that things are going to change. How do we apply this today? What do we do with this? Is this telling us that we all need to go get concealed carry? It's not what we're talking about. But we do understand there is an idea of practical preparedness that we should do in order to get the gospel out. There's nothing lacking in faith by getting insurance. And by the way, we have insurance. By the way, as a pastor, I have to have special insurance for counseling and giving religious advice that I have to be protected from. There's an idea that we have locks on our door. There's an idea of safety of sending people two by twos. There's an idea that we watch where we go. There's an idea of protectiveness. There's an idea of having insurance for people in vehicles. Those are natural things of protection that we have. And it's not lack of faith. It is understanding we're living in a world today that's increasingly hostile. And they don't care if you're going to church or not. There's an actual, an idea of preparedness. There's an idea that we need to be concerned about the things and do things decently in order for our protection in a world that is getting worse and worse and worse. Does this say that we need a big bunker and uh, endure to the end of times? It's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about in order to get the gospel out, in order to be a good testimony, in order to go out. Nothing like a horrible testimony of saying, hey, we didn't have insurance. We didn't do anything to prepare for. And now our church burnt down. Let's go get a good foot, GoFundMe change. Is that even more act of faith to have a GoFundMe than to have a natural thing of insurance? We understand there should be natural things that we should do to prepare. We're not against insurance. We're not against doctors. We're not against the other things. We're just trying to be naturally prepared. So with that, what do we do with such things? Well, we continue to make sure the church is done. But maybe there's something that you need to check on. There's this idea that people say, I need to force people to believe like you do. You do not. We let God do his own work, using, letting us be vessels. But it is not your responsibility to force people to believe like you do. And it is nothing but pride, like the disciples had, to believe that you have to force people to believe. We can trust God to do his own work. That's the faith we have, is that our faith is in God to do his own work. We do everything we can to prepare. By the way, is studying prepared? Absolutely. There are some people who criticize my preaching saying, listen, fire don't come on paper. You don't need notes. You just get up there and let it rip. You know, I've seen a lot of good fires start tindling up because uh, some good study. There's an idea that of a blind faith that has no pr preparedness, no wisdom, nothing applied. And what it does is make those people opened up to attack to criticism that didn't need to happen. Those are some natural preparedness that we have to do for ourselves, all for the purpose of allowing the gospel to go out unhindered as we have a good testimony. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And Lord, I don't know exactly how you spoke to these good folks. We're just trying to speak this passage and we make applications to the church and some of the things that we do. But maybe there's someone in here that has some other decisions. Are you doing what you can to be prepared in a world that's increasingly getting worse and worse? Or maybe perhaps you have fallen into that trap of pride that you feel like you have to make people believe we have to let God do his own work. We need to do everything reasonably that we can, but we can trust you to do your own work. I'm asking that you would put a protection around us and give us much wisdom as this church has every desire to move forward, that we could do things decently in order. We could do things out of wisdom, that we could do things that could protect this church in case accidents and tragedies happen. But 
things that would help us so the work would not be stalled, but we could continue to go forward even in the midst of heartbreak and tragedy. Lord, we love you so very much, and you are. Time to watch this message from the Riverview Baptist Church. If you've made a decision for the Lord, we would love to hear from you. Or if there's anything else we could do to be a blessing to you, please let us know. You could write us at Riverview Baptist Church, 216 North Main Street, Seymour, Wisconsin, 54165, or email us at git rbcinfo at gmail.com. You could also join us online for live and past messages on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, or our website, riverviewbc.com. You could also keep up with all the latest things going on at the Riverview Baptist Church by downloading our app. Search Riverview Baptist Church in your app store or text Riverview BC app to 77977. Thanks again for watching this message.